Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on the cardiovascular system. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look uh, in detail at the soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme. Whoops, solu solulube. Soluble uh, guanonate cyclase enzyme, which is important in uh, the nitric oxide signaling pathways, i.e. the endothelium-derived uh, relaxation. Okay, so soluble guanonate cyclase. Right, okay, so the structure of this video, the way I'm going to structure this video is that uh, we're firstly going to discuss uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the endothelium-derived relaxation pathway, i.e. the nitric oxide uh, cyclic GMP signaling pathway. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the structure of a soluble guanolate uh, cyclase enzyme. Then we're going to look at how in the uh, soluble guanolate cyclase enzyme is activated by nitric oxide, which is the endothelium-derived relaxation factor. And then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few pharmacological agents which are capable of blocking or activating uh, the soluble guanolate, um, oh dear, soluble guanolyl. Uh, soluble guanolyl cyclase is another name, but soluble guanolate cyclase is a more common name that you see. Right, okay, uh, so let's just start with a quick reminder of uh, the endothelium-derived relaxation pathway. Right, so, if we draw a blood vessel here, then just to remind you of the different layers of the blood vessel. So, uh, the innermost layer here that lines the lumen of the blood vessel is the endothelial cell. So let's say here is an endothelial cell, here is an endothelial cell, here is an endothelial cell, another one, and so on. So here are a bunch of endothelial cells that line the lumen of the blood vessel. So they are in contact with the blood inside this lumen here. Okay, and then around that, uh, those the endothelial cells which line the lumen of the blood vessel, there is then uh, a basement membrane on which the endothelial cell sits. So this in green is the basement membrane here. So this is the basement membrane. Okay, right, uh, and then uh, peripheral to the uh, basement membrane on which the endothelial cells are sitting is then the tunica media, which is made up of the smooth muscle cells and also a lot of elastic tissue, uh, elastic fibers, uh, which surround the blood vessel as well. So around here, what you have is a ri rings of smooth muscle cells, so like this, rings of smooth muscle cells surrounding the lumen of the blood vessel. So here is a ring of smooth muscle cells. Right, and basically what can happen is uh, when you s um, stimulate the endothelium uh, with uh, certain uh, chemical stimuli such as acetylcholine, what you can stimulate is the endothelium to start producing nitric oxide. So the endothelium activates uh, it's calcium-dependent uh, nitric oxide synthase enzyme, the NOS-free enzyme, or the endothelial NOS, ENOS. Okay, uh, and what's going to happen is that these endothelial cells are going to start producing nitric oxide. So here comes nitric oxide coming out from these uh, endothelial cells. So this basically is nitric oxide that is being produced by the endothelial cells, and... Um, and is diffusing to the smooth muscle cells that line, uh, which well, which are peripheral to the endothelial cells in this uh, blood vessel structure. Okay, so nitric oxide is often abbreviated to NO for short, and correctly, strictly speaking, it should be nitric monoxide, but people often just call it nitric oxide. Okay, so nitric oxide used to be called, and sometimes you will still see it referred to this, the endothelium-derived relaxation factor, because basically, uh, before we knew uh, that um, the endothelium was releasing, um, releasing nitric oxide, we knew that it was releasing some chemical mediator that was causing relaxation of the smooth muscle. So we called this mediator that the endothelium was releasing the endothelium-derived relaxation factor, even though we didn't actually know what it was. Then later on, it was discovered that this um, molecule that was actually causing the relaxation of the smooth muscle cells around it, so these are these 
smooth muscle cells in Chinica media of the blood vessel, so these are smooth muscle cells, uh, that this product that was causing the relaxation was indeed nitric oxide. Okay. Right, now what happens? How does nitric oxide actually cause the relaxation of these muscle cells? And then uh, if you relax these muscle cells, of course, they'll become longer, so they'll elongate. And then the circumference of this entire ring of smooth muscle cells will increase, meaning that the diameter of that ring of smooth muscle cells is going to increase. And uh, that's going to dilatate the um, lumen of the blood vessel, and therefore uh, you achieve vasodilatation. Okay, so uh, n how does nitric oxide actually achieve this? Well, if we draw one of these smooth muscle cells out here, so let's say this is a smooth muscle cell here, okay, then inside the smooth muscle cell there is an enzyme called soluble guanylate cyclase, which for now we'll just draw like this, although we will see exactly what the structure of this enzyme is in this video. Oops, okay. Here we go, right. So this is the soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme, which is often uh, just abbreviated to SGC, because there are different types of guanylate cyclase enzymes. Some of them are, um, are associated with the plasma membrane, and those are not soluble guanylate cyclase. These ones are free in the cytoplasm, basically, and that's why they're called soluble guanylate cyclase. Is. Uh, as we'll see, it's slightly an odd name because actually another, there are two types of soluble guanylate cyclases, ones which are found in the uh, endothelial cells of the uh, blood vessels, and then ones which are found in neurons in the brain, and we're going to see actually that the soluble guanylate cyclases in the brain are actually membrane associated. So it's a little bit of an odd name, but certainly the ones in the smooth muscle cells are uh, free in the cytoplasm. Right, so what's going to happen is that nitric oxide is going to come into the smooth muscle cell. It's a, um, it's a lipid-soluble molecule, so it can quite easily pass through the phospholipid bilayer, and it's going to activate this soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme. And what that means is that the soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme is going to start um, converting guanosine triphosphate, GTP, into cyclic guanosine monophosphate, cyclic GMP, and also it will produce pyrophosphate in that conversion as well. Right, and then cyclic GMP is then going to activate the cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase, or protein kinase G here. And protein kinase G is then going to cause uh, the smooth muscle to relax by uh, activating the myosin light chain phosphatase, which will remove the phosphate heads from um, the uh, myosin heads, as well as inactivating the IP3 receptor to reduce calcium release in the smooth muscle cell and um, activating the circa pump to try and re return calcium back into uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and out of the cytoplasm as quickly as you can. So, uh, the important thing for our video is just to understand that once the soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme becomes activated and releases cyclic GMP, and then that cyclic GMP is going to cause the smooth muscle cell to, uh, to relax, sorry. Right, okay, so uh, what we now want to do is we want to study uh, the structure of the soluble guanylate cyclase in a more detail. So basically, uh, soluble guanylate cyclase enzymes consist of two subunits, an alpha and a beta subunit. So let me draw it like here. So here's the amino terminus of the alpha subunit. Then up here, what we have is a domain known as the H Knox domain, okay, okay, and uh, which stands for the uh, heme nitric oxide and oxygen binding domain. But we'll come back to that in a moment. So this is the H Knox domain here. Then you have a portion known as the pass reg regulatory domain, and I'll label that in a moment. And then you have the catalytic domain down here. Okay, and it's half of the catalytic enzyme, basically. So let's say this is the alpha subunit here. And then its neighbor, basically, will be the beta subunit. And I should say that at the end, you'll then have the carboxyl terminal of this polypeptide. Then, let's draw the beta subunit here. And they're bound together, basically. So here's the H-NOX domain again. So this one has an H-NOX domain. 
and again it has its amino terminus up here and then it has a PAS regulatory domain further down and then it has the other half of this catalytic enzyme here so those are going to come together and make the full catalytic enzyme here okay right uh, so again it will have its carboxyl term tail down here right so this is the beta subunit of the guanylate cyclase enzyme, guanylate cyclase enzyme. So the guanylate cyclase enzyme is made up of these two subunits, the alpha subunit and the beta subunit. So these domains down here, these are the catalytic domains. Okay, and let me get some color on this picture. Right, so the catalytic domains then, we'll color these in blue. So the catalytic domains are these domains that I'm going to color in blue here. So these are these two together, which have basically, together they dimerize and make the active enzyme, but there are two halves to them, basically. So one of these, one half of the catalytic domain is provided by the alpha subunit, and the other half is provided by this beta subunit over here. Together they dimerize together, and you then have the full uh, catalytic enzyme basically so this is now the enzyme which will convert GTP into cyclic GMP okay uh, then uh, we have this domain in the middle here so let me cover this one in here so this is the PAS regulatory domain so this domain in green is called the uh, PAS PAS regulatory domain regulatory domain and this domain basically has uh, links with the equivalent domain on the other subunits there are links basically between these two subunits of the alpha and well between the alpha and the beta subunit and the links are between the PAS regulatory domains of um, each of these subunits and this domain up here this HNOX domain this is very very important because this is where we are going to stick a heme group onto our enzyme, basically. And it's the heme group that is going to sense the nitric oxide, basically. Okay, so this stands for heme. Uh, so that's the English spelling of heme. Here's the American spelling of heme, H-E-M-E. -E. Uh, and then it's nitric oxide, nitric oxide slash oxygen binding um, domain okay binding domain right okay so that overall now is the structure of our soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme so this is our soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme so to review it consists of these uh, two subunits an alpha subunit and a beta subunit which dimerize together uh, and together they form the whole soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme. Each of them has an HNOX domain, uh, which stands for the heme uh, nitric oxide uh, oxygen binding domain. Both of them have PAS regulatory domains, which are bound together. And then at the carboxyl terminus of each of these proteins, you have a catalytic domain, and those two catalytic domains dimerize to make the functional enzyme. So this down here, this whole thing now, not just one half on its own, the whole thing, you need the whole thing, this is a guanylate cyclase enzyme. So this protein here is now going to um, convert GTP to uh, cyclic GMP. So it's the soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme doesn't have two uh, guanylate cyclase enzyme, it has two catalytic domains uh, which come together to make one enzyme, basically. Okay, uh, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.